Well, so I have had this on repeat since the beginning of this series in 1 Corinthians. And, by the way, we'll continue to remind you of the reality of what we see happening in the church in Corinth. Oftentimes, the, the mess we find ourselves in is the result, twofold, of the enemy and the inner me. The enemy and the inner me. Our flesh is the inner me that Paul speaks about in Romans 7. I do what I want to do, but I don't do what I want to do. What is this? This is sin within me, causing me to do what I don't want to do. What's the answer? And at the end of that, Jesus, the answer uh, Paul gives is the answer is Christ. It's the cross that gives us freedom. Amen? But we also have an enemy, an evil presence, uh, a real strategic and intentional enemy called Satan, devil, that is absolutely real. Uh, who wants to stop the work of God and stop the work of God through you. Uh, so the enemy and the inner me. And as we continue to navigate through 1 Corinthians, it's important to yet again remind you what the actual battle is and where the actual battle resides. And so I want to read to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 to 4, Paul says it this way, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds, that's demonic strongholds and footholds. And so with this kind of battle that we face, this is not the end of the story. Uh, you need to be encouraged today that this is not the end of the story. So we have this battle that we wage every single day. We're not left to our own devices. The answer is Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, the good news is this, is that although this battle is no joke and must not be treated lightly, we have already won this battle. Why? Because of the cross and because of the resurrected Christ that we worship. Now, in, in uh, Africa, um, when, when you get moved, uh, people stand up, and I'm not asking that you do this, but if you feel comfortable, it's all good. You have permission. Uh, when they get moved by the Spirit through the Word, they stand up and scream, Hallelujah! Uh, so that's my hallelujah. Because of the resurrected Christ and because of the cross, man, there is true freedom. It's not just here. It's in our hearts. It's in our minds, in our hearts. Amen? It moves us. There you go. I feel like I'm in Africa. Let's go. So we have the weapons to fight this battle strategically and advantageously because of the spiritual gear and the inventory list that we read in Ephesians chapter 6 putting on the whole armor of God. And so with that, let's pray. Father, we love you. Uh, we thank you for uh, such a time as this to bring us together in this environment, in this setting, knowing that you have not forsaken us, you've not left us. And God, you are absolutely present here. And so we say thank you. I pray that you would move in our hearts and our minds and our lives to uh, receive your word today. And, uh, Lord, whatever you want to do, we say yes. I pray that you would get me out of the way. I pray that your word would speak for itself. Spirit, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of my message this morning is When Water Gets in the Boat. When water gets in the boat. How many are boat lovers? How many love to just boat out there? Awesome. Um, and so as we begin this morning, because... Connor, thank you for reminding us that we are an interactive bunch here at Landmark Church. If you're new, you'll realize that we are an interactive bunch. Um, I just, that's just kind of my style. I don't, don't want to just be up here and be just listening. We got we to gotta be interactive. Amen. So as we begin this morning, I want to ask you, interactive bunch, what must you do when large amounts of water get into a boat? Get out, bail, what else? Prepare what I hear. What was this? Don't be shy. Don't be shy. So all the things. Say again. Put on your life vest. Okay, so we, okay, so we're, this is good. This is good. We're all on the same page. Let me ask this leading question for us. Um, and it's this. Uh, what would happen if you fail to bail water out of the boat? You would sink. What else? Possibly drown. Yeah, you get wet, miserable. Okay. 
uh, it's pretty cool. When we were with Joel, Pastor Joel and Stephanie at their new place in Dar Salaam, literally on the Indian Ocean. They have a beach house. Their, their backyard is sand. It's beach sand. It's beautiful. Like talk about like a retreat from ministry. Praise God that God's given them favor in that. And uh, so we spent some time, those last five days of our trip, uh, spent a lot of time. Like I wake up like 5.30 in the morning and watch the sunset over the Indian Ocean. And uh, it was pretty, pretty cool. And uh, what? Oh, sorry. Well, sunset too, but sunrise specifically at 5.30 in the morning. So it's not like that across the world. Like that would be weird. I, I'm not really good at geography, but anyways. Okay, so it was the sunrise. And being with Jesus early, that mo- early those mornings, um, you would see like fishermen out there. And in, in all kinds of, like, different size boats, too. Like, in the, in the big to medium-sized boats, like, ten of them out there fishing and casting nets. Kind of reminds me of, like, when we read the Bible and we see the, the disciples out there fishing. And, uh, and so they got their bright lights on, and then they're coming in to the shore, and then their lights go down. And you just hear them out there fishing. And then you also have, you know, what we saw regularly were like canoes and, and sailboats. These guys are out there fishing. That's their trade. And it would be like something like this. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, that was one of the sailboats out there. And it would be a regular thing. I mean, Joel and Stephanie say that they see this on a regular basis where one guy's out there doing his thing on the top of trying to get his sail all set, and uh, he's bailing out water. Bailing out water at the same time while catching fish and running the business. So we realize that if he wouldn't do that, it would be all bad. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, is what we're going to start out with this morning. Read with me as we start. Paul writes, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you, something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves, but you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. And you should remove this man from your fellowship. Welcome to the next chapter in our series. Uh, So glad to be back from Africa. I've had several weeks to really pray through this, knowing that this was going to be the message coming back. Um, and uh, what's really going on here? Uh, we're going we're gonna to navigate through this this morning together. And so we will find out exactly why Paul would be so adamant about removing this man from your church. Um, I want to show something that I think you're all familiar with. This is our logo that God gave me, us, for a new vision as um, the season of Living Water Church kind of restarted. And, uh, and I'd like to say that our logo I- uh, presents a story. There's a story here, and in talking to the artists that put this together, really just sharing my heart and what God had shown me, uh, literally showed me this vision. Uh, there's a lot of subtle things, but also intentional things in this logo, in this, I- I- and I, I'd be even cautious to say that's branding, but, but the logo tells a story. It tells about the church. tells about us. And, and in many ways, it talks about, you know, it shares and it shows us even 25 years as a church where, where we've seen people come and go. And we've seen, we've seen all the, the changes. But nevertheless, here we are today, continuing on the mission that God has set forth for us to bring the light of Jesus to a world that needs it. And one of the subtle things is that uh, you'll see that the bow uh, actually represents the church, our church. And uh, the boat is not like sailing on crystal waters, like calm waters. It's actually intentionally moving, being tossed to the left and to the right. Uh, and that means uh, this, this quote came out of covid that, um, you know, we're in the same storm, but not all of us are in the same boat. I I think that's pretty relevant to our logo and to the story of Living Water Church. Um, Not everybody chooses to be in the boat. 
uh, not everybody chooses to be un unified in the boat. Uh, some would rather just kind of bail overboard. Uh, but nevertheless, the boat is Christ, the Holy Spirit, and keeps us, protects us, and moves us. So the fact that the boat is moving means that we're on mission. Now, the water, the oceans, represent people. And, uh, and, and, and out there swimming, and I'd like to say that those who are lost, and there's many, are out there drowning, uh, trying to um, get air from, from the drowning. Uh, and so you have this big ocean of what I would like to say, it's an ocean of people who are stuck in this mindset and heart set of pretending. It's a lot of pretending, a lot of lack of true authenticity. Uh, and so here we are, and there's the little water. And actually, there's a subtle thing. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, that, that there's an L and a W in that water. It means that in the midst of the water, there's a living water. And who is that? It's Christ. We sang about it this morning. That allows us to move in the middle of the ocean of people who are lost and broken and under a, a, a spirit that they don't even know they're under. And so, Living Water Church, I share this because um, I, I want us to, I want to remind you that today as we talk through this and looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the metaphor is that the boat represents the church or a church. And so what happens when water gets in the boat? Well, you've already said it. There's water, but then there's water. There's lots of it that in fact can weigh down the boat. Uh, and if not treated appropriately and timely, it can in fact lead to a sinking boat. Then oftentimes when this happens, people start wandering and they're scratching their heads and saying, how did this happen? We didn't see it coming. We never saw that coming. How did this happen? And so this morning, we're going to look at a very serious element of church life that many choose to ignore. Why? Well, because it's messy. It is very messy. And the truth is, things get messier if it doesn't get dealt with in a wise biblical manner. And so in this message, I want to discuss when sin, specifically spiritual pride, say spiritual pride, this is the sin that's happening, and when that gets into the boat, how do we deal with that in a biblical, timely way with compassion, with a winsome spirit, and with discernment? And so the first point I want to leave with us today is this, and I want you to repeat it, okay, because we're an interactive bunch. You ready? Jesus is our captain. Jesus is our captain. That's where you say hallelujah. hallelujah. This is the truth. I'm telling the truth today. Jesus is our captain. He is our leader. I want to remind us of something that I think probably is obvious, that Jesus is our captain. He's our leader. But more often than not... Boats, churches, capsize because it lost its way by unintentionally and, God forbid, intentionally forgetting who their captain was and is. They go along building, and before you know it, they're building their own kingdoms. God protect us from that. We see God doing great work in your lives. And you're saying yes to the Lord more and more. And a community helps that. That's strength in numbers. Amen? We need one another to, to prod us along, even when we're susceptible to say, I don't want to do that. And there's a brother that comes alongside me and says, Rob, I, I confirm that this is what God's doing. Step out and tell that person across the way that God loves them. Okay? So, so we don't want to build our own kingdoms. Verse 3 through 5, continuing our passage. Paul says, or writes, even though I'm not with you in person, I'm with you in the spirit. And though I was with, and as though I were, sorry, and as though I were there, I've already passed judgment on this man. Don't draw your conclusions about Paul until we get to the end of the story, by the way. It might sound like he's the one that's judging. Verse 4. Pass judgment on this man in the name of the Lord Jesus. You must call a meeting of the church. I will present you 
I'll be present with you in spirit. And so, here it is, will the power of our Lord Jesus, he's our captain, he's our leader. Then, verse 5, you must throw this man out, listen, and hand him over to Satan. What is Paul saying here? That's not PC. Um, actually, if you look at the context here, what Paul is basically saying to him, to, to the church, thus the man, let this man hit rock bottom. Why? So that he will repent. Um, this, this is what Paul is saying here. Then you must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day of the, of the Lord's return. You see, the church in Corinth forgot who their captain, who their leader was early on in the process uh, because we see here an emphasis that Paul addresses by simply saying that Jesus' power is with you even when I, Paul, is not there with you physically. I'm not there in person. I'm not even online. Like, I'm, I'm not there. But, but know this, Jesus is there. I'll set my side as, myself aside in raising up and starting this church and my leadership from afar. But know this, even though I'm not there, Jesus is there. He's our captain. Hallelujah. And here's the thing. Humanly speaking, I think I'm probably stating the obvious. I, I know it is the case for me. Humanly speaking, we hate to confront evil. We loathe it. And we would rather just hope it somehow and some way disappears. I shove it under the carpet. And if I don't see it, then it doesn't exist. But you know how it is with sin. It's still there and it's festering. And that's what authenticity is all about. We bring it to light. Not for condemnation, but to allow God to, to move and change us in the name of Christ. So why do you think this is the case? Talk to me. Why do you think we just naturally just don't like to confront evil? Shame, fear. We don't want to be a hypocrite. Timidity, just being passive about it. We want to be liked. Oh, that's the thing I got to keep praying for. Be a God pleaser rather than a man pleaser. Okay. Greed. Is that what you said? What else? It won't be received. Yeah. It's hard. It's difficult. It's uncomfortable. We are desensitized. Like the first time you pull that bandit off, it's like, ow. But then keep doing that, and it's like, I don't even feel it. Okay, good. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> hallelujah. <laughs> Woo, that's how they do it. They, they go, hallelujah. Yeah, that's how they do it. <sighs> well, here's, here's the interesting thing. Now, I don't know if you've considered this because we've already just spent a little bit of time of just our natural response to evil. We just don't want to confront it. We, we just, like, uh, avoid it. But, but here's the thing. Like, this is the truth. It's interesting that the opposite is true that evil has no problem confronting the truth. Like, like, it's true. And so now we find ourselves like on the, like we just like, we're just weighed down by just this, the, the cares of this world, but then we've got a culture that's, I mean, pretty aggressive. Um, and, and here's the truth. This is the product of a world that Isaiah 520 speaks of when uh, it says, what sorrow upon those who say that evil is good and good is evil. When they say that dark is light and light is dark, welcome to 2024. Uh, not just here, but across the world. We know that the kingdom of darkness is, the kingdom of this world is, yeah, the evil one. You know, one of the main reasons why we choose not to confront evil is because we lack confidence. We are insecure, and I say this in love to you and to me. We lack confidence and we are insecure in the person who is truth, Jesus. He's our captain. Hallelujah. I said that so contained. Hallelujah. 
But it's actually hallelujah. That's how they do it. One of the most difficult things in the Christian journey while growing in truth and faith and love is, is, is growing and learning in relationship in the one you do not see. We know that Jesus is always with us, amen? But how many times do we forget? I mean, we really do. We get caught up in the troubles of this world, and, and we, we, we uh, lament and say, God, where are you? And he says, as a gentleman that he is, I'm right here. I've never left. I know that there's somebody that needs to hear that today. He's right there with you. Uh, and as a follower of Christ, he's in you. So we can say unequivocally with a grand hallelujah, he's more than in you. Well, he's more than with you. He's in you. So Jesus' promise of never leaving and forsaking you is the truth. Somebody needs to hear that today. I know I do. Every single day, we got to be reminded that Jesus is our captain. And so it's difficult that we know Jesus is there, but we don't see him. We don't see him. We know he's with us. But the faith it takes to believe that he is there without seeing him, indeed, listen, unlocks and activates the power of the kingdom of God. This is how it's been divinely orchestrated. There will be a day when the veil will be removed and we will see God, see Jesus in his fullness. It's coming. It's coming. You need to be encouraged that that is the inheritance that's coming sooner than later because every day is closer to that. Jesus is our captain. He is our leader. And we need to be reminded of this often. I want to quickly show you this little video. I had the opportunity. It was not planned. It was totally Holy Spirit driven where uh, Karen and I got to participate and be a part of uh, literally an African church in the village. Like I was, during worship time, I was videoing and I'm like, it kind of reminds me of the church that we were just at. And, and so we got picked up by the pastor and his wife and uh, and we had this, like, he, he had, like, this 10-minute conversation before we hit the road. It took about 10 minutes to get there. And, uh, and he said, Rob, uh, I want to say to you, we're so honored and blessed that you are taking the time out of your schedule to come and see our church. Um, because we don't get guests often, we're just a small little church in the middle of a village. Uh, we really believe that God is using you to bring a message to us, and so you're going to preach. So anybody around here at Living Water who gets on me and gets on my case when I ask you last minute, Jack, to, uh, <coughs> uh, it's touche. I mean, it's touche. It I had to go across the world to really feel that. And, uh, and boy, did I. Because uh, I'm, I'm a kind of guy that likes to prepare and be ready. But yeah, and the church absolutely there in the village mirrored this one, especially when we're out there in the field of faith. And uh, so I just want to uh, show this quick video of me having the opportunity after my message to pray for these beautiful people. Thank you for these people. Thank you for their lives. Thank you that you're using them in this community to bring the light of Jesus in darkness. So that people will come to Jesus. I put a blessing of favor and protection yes. on this church body. Yes. Okay. Whew, that just took me back. Yeah, hallelujah. Uh, here's my point by uh, showing you that is to just reinforce that Jesus as our captain is global. Uh, when I say Jesus is the captain and the leader, it's not just here in America, specifically Wilton, Elk Grove, Gaul, wherever we are. It's global. And this is an opportunity for us to remind those that God puts in front of us that he is our leader. He is our captain. The second thing is this. 
uh, from what we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, the call to really take care of the water in the boat when that happens is uh, it is remove pride from the inside. Remove pride from the inside. Let me ask you this question. Back to our water in the boat analogy. When is it necessary to start bailing water out of the boat? Is it when the water's ankle deep, knee deep, or waist deep? How many of you would say that it's, um, that would be waist deep? Start bailing the water out. How many would say that absolutely it's knee deep? How many would say unequivocally that it's when it's ankle deep? 100%. Back to the passage, verse 6. Paul writes to this church, your boasting, your pride about this is terrible. Don't you realize that this sin is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast by removing this wicked person from among you. Then you will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what and who you really are. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us, so let us celebrate the festival. He's, 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 um, uh, he's uh, mentioning there the Passover. So let us ce celebrate the, the festival, not with the old bread of wickedness and evil, but with the new bread of sincerity and truth, manna. It's manna from heaven. New bread, the bread of sincerity and truth. You see, Paul is urging the Corinthian believers to live up to what they already are. The forgiven and set apart people of Christ and said this way, why would the Corinthian Christians allow sin that Christ had died for to continue to be flagrantly practiced among them? It's a question, an important question to consider as we keep diving in here. Do you know what the unpardonable, the unforgivable sin is? There is such a thing. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, Matthew chapter 12, 30 to 32, Jesus says it this way, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. There's no gray there. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me, and anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. Jesus says, so I, will, so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. Sobering words that should cause us to lean in and not lean away from. Sobering words to cause us to press into holiness. And how is that found? Through? Through Christ. Not our own good works. It's through Christ. Listen, the root of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is pride. God hates pride. Some would say, well, God doesn't hate anything. He hates pride. And Proverbs 16, 5 says it this way, the Lord detests, he hates, he loathes the proud, they will surely be punished. The issue at hand, which takes five chapters for Paul to address, is spiritual pride. He says your boasting, your pride is terrible. Why? Well, the answer is because pride keeps people, it keeps you and I from the unconditional love of Christ. We like to put lists on things to somehow get God to like us, let alone love us. That's pride. Spiritual pride, actually. Do you want to know what makes pride very dangerous? It strips and steals who you are. With its eventual goal to ultimately destroy your identity, who you are in Christ. And even in the middle of this incredible mess, this great sin that Paul doesn't mince any words, Paul reminds the Corinthian believers of who they are. He shares that, the truth, and he does it with compassion. You will be like a fresh batch of dough made without yeast, which is what you really are. And it's because of Christ, our Passover lamb, he's been sacrificed for you, for us. Hallelujah. 
I want to share uh, and invite Kara up because we firsthand got to see, like in front of us, the proof is in the pudding, the evidence of the kingdom of God working through these girls. And one of the biggest things that they have to be reworked on by the power of the Holy Spirit is their identity. And so I've asked Kara to share. Okay, so I kind of forgot what he wanted me to say. Um, well, <laughs> okay, well, basically, the girls have been through abandonment by their parents, sold into prostitution. Um, some of them, basically, once they get a step parent, if a parent passes, there, there's a lot of death in Africa. If, if they get a step parent, then the step parent doesn't ever like their step kids. Like it's it's the truth. So then they'll go out on the streets, and for them to come to a safe house that is run by Christians, mind you, there are some safe houses r run by Muslims as well. So this is why it's so important for them to have more Christian homes, safe homes, where they can find their identity in Christ. They come there and they find out they are wanted. They do have a Savior that loves them. We watched so many girls over the years, and you know this too, that you know they'll come with their hijab and, and everything, and they found their identity in some kind of religion and works and spiritual pride, and then they realize Jesus took it all. And there, this last time we were there, there was not one girl that still claimed to be Muslim. And it was such a blessing to see them have freedom in Christ away from religion. Folks, you and I, were not religious. We have a relationship with Jesus. Thank you, Kara. Now you're preaching. Hallelujah. Okay, we're on our last point. You can say hallelujah. <laughs> Repeat it after me. Lead out of faith. Not fear. Now you could argue that all church disasters, all church implosions are the result of pride. Uh, that may be too simple, but it's the truth. J. Oswald Sanders said it this way, Pray, pride takes many forms, but spiritual pride is the most grievous. To become proud of spiritual gifts or a leadership position is to forget that all we have is from God. All the position we have is God's appointment. And some examples of spiritual pride include, just to name a few, carrying a spirit of offense, getting angry with no self-control, sexually impure patterns, an unwillingness to acknowledge error, delaying in apologizing, Delaying in restoring fellowship with our fellow brothers and sisters in the church, allowing resentment and bitterness instead to take root, just to name a few. Verse 9, Paul continues writing, When I wrote to you before, I told you not to associate with people who indulge in sexual sin. Here's the crux, here's the, the, the key point to this whole letter, this part in the letter where Paul is addressing this sin, specifically spiritual pride. Get it out. That's water in the boat that needs to not be there. Here it is. But I was not talking about unbelievers who indulge in sexual sin or are greedy or cheat people or worship demonic idols. You'd have to leave this world to avoid people like that. Verse 11, I meant that you are not to associate with anyone, here it is, who claims to be a believer yet indulges in sexual sin or is greedy or worships idols or is abusive or is a drunkard or cheats people. Don't even eat with such people. What Paul is saying here is this. Unbelievers are judged by God and they will be judged by God. So let that be. That's not our position to judge people who are unbelievers. We're to show compassion and love of Christ. Instead, get rid of the hypocritical spirit in your midst because this kind of person is led by an unholy spirit, not by the Holy Spirit. A hypocritical spirit is one who lives under and out of an abuse of grace. 
by suggesting that I can do whatever I want because God forgives me and loves me unconditionally anyway. That's not, it, it, this kind of abuse of grace is, it, it, it's like, it's, we were never called to have freedom to sin. F- true freedom is from sin, away from sin. And the answer is Christ, hallelujah. A religious spirit always leads to a rebellious spirit. The answer unequivocally always it's the truth. Repentance is the cure. There is a high standard when it comes to inside the church, not a standard of perfection. The sacredness and reverence of the church is not practiced out of legalism or license, but out of grace and truth. The Spirit of God resides in temples, not made out of stone or wood, but rather temples of human spirit. And because of this, there is a great responsibility and mandate upon what goes on in the church. Why? So that it can function in a healthy missional way out from the church into the world. To be a church that serves the living God in biblical love and true gospel mission. Verse 12, it isn't my responsibility, Paul writes, to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. But as the scriptures say, he's quoting Deuteronomy 17, 7, you must remove the evil person from among you. Bottom line, spiritual pride destroys churches. And you can track this one thing as the main culprit, leading out of fear rather than out of faith. Leading out of fear rather than out of faith. Why do you think God hates, why he detests, why he loathes pride so much? It's because it comes from the king of pride. Where Lucifer said, I am greater, I will be greater than God. And he said, you are out. The evil one always stirs up trouble inside a church, causes and fosters fear rather than faith from the top down, and then sits back and waits with great anticipation for church destruction to take place. And you need to know this. Satan is very patient when it comes to this mission of destroying churches from the inside out. And this is why Matthew 10, 16 is so relevant and applicable. And Jesus is speaking, he says, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Leading out of faith rather than out of fear means that we don't have to look over our shoulder every single second of every single day. But be on guard for the works of the devil are very covert and strategic Be a watchman on the tower and be wise as a snake, which means to act intelligently and wisely in the decisions that we make, always conversing with our spiritual guide, the Holy Spirit. Harmless as dove means to be tame, to be gentle and humble with peace and calm. And simply said it this way, lead out of faith and not out of fear. And Living Water Church, we are so committed to this. I'm thankful for the men that in my life that check my heart and check my spirit and among one another. Let us continue to take the path moving ahead that we not let pride, specifically spiritual pride, infiltrate this church. Amen? Today's message is a call to holiness. And I'm going to ask the team to come up, lead us in some song. Being and doing church is not something on the side. It's not something to simply do once a week. It's not even a label, Living Water Church, to wear once in a while. No, the church is called to spiritually and physically infiltrate and permeate the culture that loves darkness rather than light with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel is that he lived, he died, He rose again, and here's the thing. This completes the gospel. He's coming back. He's coming back. Hallelujah. (laughs) That's where we say it. That's where we say it. 
to bring salvation through Christ, to bring healing from brokenness and deliverance from the bondage of sin and death in Jesus' name. This is the calling. And because of this, being in Christ is not something to treat lightly. Our true responsibility, church, comes first not from one another. Listen, it comes, accountability, true accountability comes from the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who, yes, at times, we don't see. So let us respond to the Holy Spirit now. Let's pray. The previous uh, um, passage that Jack preached was uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And the very last verse of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 20, is this. The kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Living. Not talking about it. Not wishing for it. Not sitting on the sidelines, but actually leaning in. The kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. We're going to end our time together. And if you need prayer, please don't hesitate. We, we got a, uh, back in the back table, there's a cross and the table. People will want to pray with you and for you. If you do not know Christ today, today is the day for your salvation. Found in Christ, he gave his life for you so that you would have life. And church, um, today, as I said, is a, is, a, is a call to holiness. And uh, we don't live in condemnation, but certainly the Holy Spirit convicts us. And so don't leave here today and uh, come alongside another brother or sister and say, this is what God's doing in my heart. I want to press in and not run from it. You can spend some time today praying in the back. Uh, Father, we love you. We thank you so much, God, for telling this, us the truth. Not sometimes, not partially, but all the time. Father, help us in, in, in the midst of where we battle against the enemy and the inner me. We, we need an increase of your spirit. And so uh, you say that we don't have because we don't ask. God, in this church, we ask for more of your spirit. This is John chapter 3, verse 30. says, we want more of you and less of us. Help us, Lord. We want to just continue to walk with what you're doing. It's so obvious in lives. Uh, work in our hearts first and foremost. We love you in Jesus' name.